pretty much total destruction. I, uh, I've seen every house destroyed on this road. California wildfires have become a perennial disaster. In the aftermath, aerial footage shows wrenching images of destruction. Here we see the devastating after effects of what these wildfires are leaving in their wake. But look closely at this shot. Does something seem off to you? One of the things that we're seeing that is absolutely crazy are entire houses incinerated, burned to the ground, while trees surrounding them are completely left intact, untouched. The question is, what is causing these wildfires? Let's zoom in on that. It does seem odd that the trees are standing while the houses are reduced to ash. Journalist MJ Banaya says images like these have prompted some wild explanations that are getting attention online. According to internet conspiracy theories, there's a secret government program known as Agenda 21, the purpose of which is to force people to relocate into major cities. And then, as the conspiracy theory goes, the government can then exercise more control over the population. And how is this allegedly being accomplished? Forest fires and laser guns. The theory is that the US government was using direct energy weapons to purposefully start these forest fires to clear out towns or for some other nefarious reason. Laser weapons are much more than staples of science fiction. During the Cold War, the US and USSR poured resources into orbital space weapons, even deploying some. The so-called Star Wars missile defense system was the most famous, but perhaps the most intriguing was the Air Force's YAL-1, which featured a laser system mounted in a turret on a plane's nose. And that's just the technology we know about. As you know, the US military did just launch Space Force. But could the government really be using secret energy weapons to start fires and control society? We turn to our military expert, Tim McMillan, for an explanation. The idea of directed energy weapons. It's very exciting. I mean, we, we've heard about that since Star Trek. Tim says it's true that the major space powers are all developing energy weapons to take out each other's satellites. But striking the Earth's surface? That is something that's very difficult to achieve and not technically that we know of achievable. Whenever it, it, the laser is being projected down, it's got to travel through the atmosphere, clouds. Any one of these factors are going to cause what's called atmospheric blooming. And by the time it reaches Earth, it's not going to have the amount of energy to start a fire and burn something. So if a laser weapon is not possible, then what can account for the strange aftermath footage? Science writer Mick West, who lives in wildfire country, says it's simple. Houses burn much easier than trees. But it's actually quite hard to burn green wood. To demonstrate, West decides to do his own test. I went into my attic and I got a piece of scrap wood. Then I went out into the field behind my house and I cut down a branch of a tree. And then I took both of these pieces of wood and I put them in my fire and I built identical piles of kindling under each one. And then I lit them both at the same time. The wood from my attic caught fire and burned part way through. The wood that I just cut from a tree just got a bit black on the outside, just got a bit sooty, even though they had the exact same small fires underneath, which shows that green wood doesn't burn, but the wood in your house does. In fact, the average live tree is about 50% water by weight. And while theories about directed energy weapons aren't going to go away anytime soon, that fact leads us to our unequivocal verdict. These fires are natural phenomena. December 2020. It's another beautiful day on the Southern California coast. In the sky above the Palos Verdes Peninsula in Los Angeles, a local flight instructor is giving a lesson when suddenly she and her student encounter something or someone in the airspace off their port side. As we zoom in in slow-mo, we see what looks like a man wearing a jetpack flying at an altitude of about 3,000 feet, roughly 20 miles off the coast. Now look close. You can see what appears to be legs dangling below a torso. And look right over here, a reflection of something metallic, like a backpack. But the strangest thing of all, there's no sign of exhaust. The jetpacks that are out there use kerosene, 
and they have literally multiple turbo engines attached to them. But even still, the sustained flight on those is 10 minutes max. It doesn't seem like he's close to coming down anytime soon, which says to me, he's maybe working with something special here. There are other people who have invented jetpacks that involved engines on their arms. This doesn't seem to be the case here. He doesn't seem to have any kind of complicated equipment or anything really bulky. Rumors of a similar flying figure have been swirling around Los Angeles for months before this sighting. So this guy in a jetpack had been spotted before a couple of times actually by pilots who were coming in for landings at LAX. But this was the first time he had been captured on video. The latest sighting was in August 2021. What's going on? There are a couple of theories around this that really interest me. One is that it could be some kind of secret military technology that's being tested. The other is the idea that this is the work of an amateur backyard inventor who's just not ready to reveal himself yet. This is far from the first time a flying human has shocked spectators. In 2007, a gas station owner named Kent Couch famously floated across Oregon using a chair and 105 balloons. But are these new sightings really someone on a jetpack? Our experts are cleared for takeoff. First, could these sightings just be weather balloons, which have become deflated and misshapen into a humanoid-looking profile and caught in strong crosswinds? The only way that they travel at that velocity sideways is if the winds are really, really, really high. But when Dr. Hentz checks the winds over Palos Verdes that day... If you look at the winds in this lower part of the atmosphere, all of these winds all the way up to about 3,000 meters are about 10 knots or weaker. So this was a very, very calm condition. Could this instead be a powered drone tricked out to look like a person? Our aviation expert, Tim McMillan, thinks not. We can rule out a conventional drone pretty easily because we don't see the quadcopters, the commercial drones of that nature, or even most of your military or industrial drones, you're gonna see wings or you're gonna see rotors. We don't see any of that. Despite the appearance of a human form, astrophysicist Hakim Olushehi isn't ready to confirm this is a genuine jetpack man or woman. The physics of getting to this location just does not favor a jetpack because they're at a high altitude and they're also very far away from shore. The jetpack has to carry the fuel on board and it has to fight against Earth's gravity pulling on the human being and still have enough fuel to travel horizontally. A New Zealand company called Martin Aircraft did unveil a prototype in 2016 that is reportedly capable of flying close to the same 3,000 feet altitude as this person. Their model weighs over 440 pounds without fuel or a pilot, but appears to use significantly more equipment than what has been spotted over LA. Despite that, Olu Shehi can't rule out a jetpack. Pilots have reported seeing this, so maybe there is something there. So, this is a tough one. We were going to say drone, but McMillan has us doubting that. So for now, we're gonna say this is a human using a yet unknown technology, but we still don't know for sure, and neither does the FBI. They're still investigating these sightings around Los Angeles. Okay, we're gonna come over and take a look, Evan. Copy that. All right, this is uh, rapidly becoming very ugly. Yeah, it is. Yeah, this isn't looking good. In the past five years, millions of acres of California have been consumed by wildfires. And in 2018, with the massive Wolsey fire menacing northern Los Angeles County itself, local news choppers took to the air to cover every smoky second. And then that provides a great deal of fuel for these fires. But when some viewers saw this footage, they forgot all about the flames. So the helicopter captures this massive cloud of smoke billowing up from the forest. And then all of a sudden, out of the cloud, comes this odd little shape. It's narrow, almost looks like a flat saucer on its side or a cigar shape. Journalist MJ Benias covers the unexplained, and he says the cigar-shaped UFO is a classic type, 
right up there with orbs, tic tacs, and triangles. Cigar shaped UFOs have been seen for decades, if not centuries, and we have lots of recordings of them, we have lots of witness testimony of them, uh, we have lots of photographs of them. So, for the UFO community, seeing a cigar shaped UFO, it was pretty compelling. The video caught fire online. Was a UFO somehow drawn to the flames? There's a belief that UFOs use clouds as cover and they hide behind them. I've heard stories that UFOs can actually shapeshift and look like clouds. I've also heard that UFOs enjoy frequenting sites of great devastation, forest fires included. Here's an interesting fact. More than 80% of US forest fires are started by human activity, from cigarettes to arson. Could it be that UFOs are somehow drawn to these large fires? Let's break down the video with our experts. First off, we know the video is real. It was broadcast live by a news chopper, and you can see from the independent motion of the object that it's not just a smudge on the lens. So could it have been an object from outer space entering the Earth's atmosphere? We asked the video expert Mark D'Antonio, a trained astronomer. And sometimes meteors will come in, and sometimes they hit the atmosphere at such a low angle that they can't crack and they just go skipping off the Earth. And as they do that, they start to burn up. But the California UFO wasn't burning up. And science writer Mick West, who's lived through plenty of wildfires, says it couldn't be a plane. It didn't seem to have any of the features of a plane. It had no visible wings, and it seemed to be moving either too slow or to be too big to be a plane. Set on solving this puzzle, West starts by determining precisely where the news chopper was. I looked up all the helicopters in the Flight Radar 24 tracking service and tried to figure out where they all were at that time. Then I went into Google Earth and I positioned the camera where these helicopters were at around that time. Using some satellite images of the fire, West is able to line up that image with the chopper's exact camera angle. So I could tell that the chopper's over here, we're looking over here. Then, the eureka moment. You can see here we're looking down, so it's all ocean. That's right, the sky is really the Pacific Ocean. And the cigar-shaped UFO? What if it was a boat that's actually out on the ocean? West checks the local shipping lanes, and sure enough, 15 miles off the coast is the route that all the container ships take when they're going north and south off the coast of California. So what we were looking at was a container ship. The moral of the story? Check your assumptions. That blue sky might turn out to be the blue ocean. And our verdict? That UFO turned out to be an unidentified floating object, a container ship. This story goes all the way back to California in 1971. Al Berry and his friend Ron Moorhead have come to the Sierra Nevada mountains to investigate mysterious noises reported by a bewildered group of hunters. What their microphone picks up becomes the first of a series of recordings now known as the Sierra Sounds. <laughs> The recordings capture a series of guttural grunts, howls, and growls thought to be made by an alleged Bigfoot. Very first sounds were very aggressive. Could be considered very scary. But again, they weren't, they weren't coming after us, so we don't know the intent, we don't know the agenda, we don't know what it was. Ron claims that later he even interacted with these mysterious creatures before getting his first glimpse of one. Was responding back to them. And that was uh, probably the most unique uh, Bigfoot encounter I've ever had. Field researcher Cliff Barrickman says the Sierra sounds are the gold standard of Bigfoot vocalizations. I've spoken to several witnesses that have reported this kind of sound. That says something about the authenticity of not only their sighting, but these sounds. The recordings range from guttural growls <laughs> to wild whoops. <laughs> to something that almost sounds like language. There's a retired cryptolinguist from the US Navy. He's realized that there are phonemic patterns that repeat in the sounds. Those are words. Sasquatches might be talking to one another. Now, 
Here's the thing about Bigfoot sounds. They're easy to fake and easier to misidentify. We've heard examples of both. So let's dial things down a bit and check in with our experts. Zoologist Roxy Furman notes that there are no known primates in California, but whatever made these sounds is big. The sound is really loud, and it's of quite a low pitch and frequency, so it travels far. So it's likely that it came from a large animal. Next, we bring the recordings to soundscape ecologist Dr. Ben Gottesman. So here we have three phrases. First, Gottesman examines the guttural sound. <laughs> Next, the whooping. The second has these low to high upsweep. And finally, the chatter. And those almost sound like words. The question, could those come from any known large animals native to the area? We're now going to listen to the sound of an elk bugling. <laughs> The sound of an elk bugling has much longer tonal signals. This is not a match. Now let's listen to the sounds of a black bear. <laughs> While the frequency range is similar, the shape and complexity of the signals are totally different. The Sierra sounds are on a much more advanced level. Gottesman also rules out an assortment of smaller creatures since they lacked lung capacity to create calls that loud and low. Gottesman also notices that whatever made these sounds has an enormous vocal range. If this is produced by a single creature, there is just a remarkable acoustic diversity that this alleged species has. If they are an animal, I can't confidently point to one, especially one that's native to North America. So could the sounds have been made by other humans? I do not believe it is possible for this to be human because it has a great variance of going to very high pitch down to a very low growl, all within seconds. Of <laughs> We're not capable of that without blowing out our vocal cords. My conclusion is that they are real recordings of Bigfoot, and I base that on knowing how remote that location was and the impossibility for another human or other thing to have made those sounds. The Sierra Sounds recordings are legitimate. Scientists and even some linguists point to them as evidence multiple Bigfoots were communicating with each other, as well as with Moorhead and Barry. Our verdict here, unidentified animal sounds. Regardless of what made them, the Bigfoot legend continues to speak to us. The big question is, are we really listening? <laughs>